Well, welcome everyone to our AbleNet webinar of the day. I'm uh, glad that you're able to join us. I see that a few people are still uh, hopping on, so uh, don't worry if you hear me talking and you've just jumped in. We're just starting. Uh, today's topic is switch assessment. Now, I've covered this topic from various aspects before on other AbleNet webinars, but today we're going to bring a really unique focus that I'm very excited about, where we're going to look at specifically how do we figure out the best type of switch to use and the best location for that switch for clients who have muscle weakness. These clients have very specific requirements that uh, vary from other populations that we work with. So we're going to look at specific assessment considerations that vary when we're working with people who have muscle weakness, switch types that apply to this population, some common switch placements, and then uh, top that off with a case study. Um, I forgot to introduce myself again. I'm Michelle Lang. I'm an occupational therapist, and I work in private practice in the Denver, Colorado area. And I do a lot of switch assessment because the clients that I work with uh, have significant physical limitations, and their access is often limited to looking at switches. As we know, there's lots of ways of accessing assistive technology. Switches is only one of those types. But if that's the best way for our client to access, uh, whatever their technology be, whether it's a communication device, a power wheelchair, computers, EADLs, we need to figure out, um, again, where to put that switch and what type to use. So while people are still hopping on, we're going to ask you to just go ahead and tell us who you are so we have a good sense of who has joined us for this webinar. While people are doing that too, um, and I'll mention this again at the end, we had a webinar in January, January 13th, on positioning and access. So if that's something you're interested in, you can always refer back to that recording because, of course, the client needs to be very well positioned to optimize their access. And our next webinar is going to be in March, March 10th, and that's going to focus on switch assessment for people with increased muscle tone. All right, so so far we've got about uh, nearly 40% of our participants are occupational or physical therapists. And then we have um, lots of folks from there, assistive technologists and speech language pathologists, et cetera. So thank you to everyone for uh, joining us today. Great. Okay, so with that said, let's go ahead and jump right in. First are assessment considerations. Now we've um, discussed in previous webinars some general assessment considerations for switch assessment, but what's different when we're working with a client who has muscle weakness? Well, primarily active range of motion and force is going to be limited. So when we reach out to grasp something, say your mug of coffee, that is your active range of motion. Someone else might be able to come along and move your arm further than that. That's passive range of motion. But your active range that you can move in equals the travel distance that client has to reach a switch. Also, switches, mechanical switches particularly, require a certain amount of force to activate that switch. So in the picture here, this switch needs to be pressed, activated with a certain amount of force to make that connection, that's going to be limited in people with muscle weakness. Endurance is generally limited in people who have muscle weakness too. Endurance is how long our muscle can keep going. So if I'm doing a long distance run, uh, if I was had good enough endurance for that, my muscles would require a certain amount of strength to be running, but also a certain amount of endurance to continue moving along. Endurance is limited in people of muscle weakness because the muscle fatigues very quickly. This impacts the client's ability to hit the switch repeatedly. Think about a client using a communication device. That can require hundreds of switch activations in a day. So we need to keep in mind that the switch type used and location 
need to um, help the client to maintain their best endurance. It also impacts force available over time. So perhaps the client can go ahead and activate that switch a few times, but if they have to do so repeatedly, may require a switch that requires less force. And if the client is driving a power wheelchair, that's that PWC, uh, that requires sustained force. So the client has to push the switch down and hold it down the entire time they want to sustain movement of the power wheelchair. Endurance can impact that as well. Now, in the pediatric world, we're going to see muscle weakness in clients who have spinal muscular atrophy. This is um, depending on the type of spinal muscular atrophy where we're dealing with profound muscle weakness and switch assessment is very, very critical. Uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, congenital myopathies, and other type of dystrophies. In the adult population, the uh, group that has the most challenge with muscle weakness is ALS, and that's a situation where we have to really carefully look at the best switch for a client as well, also other uh, muscular dystrophies. So in general, when we are doing an assessment for switch placement for a client with muscle weakness, we need to determine first, where does the client have movement? Where can they move anything on their body? Then we need to determine as best we can how likely that movement will persist or be spared. Now, what does that mean? Well, a lot of these conditions that we were just looking at are progressive. So we want to make sure that the client can not only activate that switch today, but hopefully for as long as possible. Certain diagnoses tend to be characterized by um, certain available movements, and some of those movements tend to persist longer than others. This can be a really difficult call, but we need to find out from the client, from the team working with them, if there are certain movements that they believe are the strongest movements and also longest lasting. We also have to determine how much force is behind the available movement. So where is the movement? How strong is the movement? And how much endurance is behind that movement? Again, for repeatability, particularly like in scanning, and sustained force like in using a power wheelchair. Now, this webinar is not worth very much if it's not something that's really going to help you out. So think of a client that you're working with right now a client with muscle weakness. If you don't happen to be working with one of those clients now, see if you can think of a client that maybe you've worked with in the past. As we move through the webinar, think of where you might try and place a switch for that client and what type of switch you think is going to work out the best. Now, an ideal switch site for our clients uses a small movement, as small a movement as possible, an isolated movement, meaning we're not pulling in a lot of overflow or reflexes, volitional movement under the client's voluntary control with controlled activation, sustained pressure if required, especially in power mobility, and controlled release. So let's look at each of these for our clients. Uh, Kelly, I see your comment about the echo. Check and make sure you're not logged in twice. You might be getting an echo if that's the case. All right, so we want as small a movement as possible. Now, this is not usually a problem for people with muscle weakness. Movements are generally small. For some of our clients with a lot of tone, the movements can be quite large. But that small movement may only be possible if the area is well supported. So in this picture here, let me get my little uh, arrow. Here we go. This is Julian's hand, and right in front of his thumb, right at the tip of that arrow, is a fiber optic switch. It's embedded in the hand pad of his arm trough. Now, for him to be able to use a very small movement of his thumb to activate that fiber optic switch, and we'll talk about fiber optics here in just a moment, his hand needs to be well supported. His forearm needs to be well supported. 
his shoulder needs to be well supported. So when we are using um, or taking advantage of very small movements with our clients, we need to make sure that that movement is very, very well supported. We also need an isolated movement. Now sometimes, again, more in clients that have increased muscle tone, a movement might pull in other movement. We might see in response to movement in one part of the body, less voluntary movement in other areas. So we want to make sure this is isolated. That's not typically a problem for clients with muscle weakness. Volitional movement is also not typically an issue. Non-voluntary movements are uncommon in people with muscle weakness. Now, sometimes there might be some muscular fasciculations. It's almost like a very small little tremor within the muscle itself, but it doesn't usually impact movement very much. For example, of some of this very small, isolated volitional movement, we're going to take a look at a video. Uh, this is Julian, who we saw in our earlier picture. Um, Julian is older now, and he is showing a very small movement that he uses to activate a fiber optic switch. Go. Good. And again. Perfect. So hopefully you're able to see that video. Um, but very small movement, he's just simply flexing that finger rearward, and a fiber optic switch is a switch that can capture that particular movement. So an ideal switch site, we want controlled activation. That means that the client needs to move towards the switch. We want to reduce that travel as much as possible for people with muscle weakness. Activation pressure to activate the switch. We want reduced pressure either using a very sensitive mechanical switch or no pressure using an electronic switch. Again, we'll talk about those switches here in just a moment. The client needs to have an acceptable level of speed in being able to activate the switch, particularly in scanning. This can be impacted by weakness, so we need to keep in mind the required speed or anticipated requirements there when we're doing an assessment. Accuracy may also be impacted by weakness. It might be that the client knows exactly when they want to hit that switch, but perhaps can't quite pull that together in a timely manner due to that weakness. Sustained pressure, again, very important in power mobility. Some of our clients might be able to sustain pressure against the switch, but quickly fatigue out. So we have to make sure we're finding a switch that will work for them over a period of time. Release, well, release is important, particularly in power mobility, because that's how we stop the chair. But the client needs to be able to release consistently. And some people with muscle weakness have a little difficulty letting go of the switch because they tend to stabilize against the switch. So when you're working with a client, if you realize, if you notice that they're having a little difficulty letting go of that switch, check and see if they're stabilizing against it. It might be that you need to provide a little more support for the client themselves to free up that movement a little more. So that's a little bit about assessment. Before we get into the actual switch types, um, I want to make sure that I answer any questions you have. I uh, forgot to mention at the beginning, feel free to type in your questions or comments at any time in the chat box. If I don't answer right away, I will get to it. I might just know that we're going to be covering that in a few minutes. But uh, feel free to type in any questions that you have at the this time or throughout the presentation. All right, while people are typing in anything, we're going to start talking about switch types. Switches are categorized into two main types, mechanical and electrical. Mechanical switches require pressure to actually activate the switch. The switch is closed, which causes activation by the force of a body part against 
the switch. These also require travel. So there's a certain amount of travel that's required to close that switch. In electrical switches, there is no pressure required, but there still is generally some amount of travel. It might be very small. And there's less feedback in most electrical switches. So mechanical switches, when you um, hit that surface, you often hear a click. Some have a louder click than others. Electrical switches are sometimes silent or have a very small amount of noise. And that noise might be a distance from the switch itself. So for example, in a fiber optic switch, you may not hear anything at the switch surface itself, but uh, there is a small box that the fiber optic switch is attached to and that might even be placed behind the client and that's where the click is. So there's just not as much feedback. Okay. Uh, Stacy has asked, how can you get around increased muscle tone being the cause for difficulty in releasing the switch? Well, you'll have to uh, join us for our next webinar because we're going to be talking about increased muscle tone then. Um, because yes, sometimes uh, clients with increased tone have difficulty releasing the switch as well. So I hope you can join us March 10th for that. And uh, we also have another question. Do you know of any switches that vibrate for feedback? Um, there are switches that vibrate. Um, and that lets the client know they hit that switch. Uh, most of those are sold by um, enabling devices. The challenge with vibrating switches for people of muscle weakness is that very vibration can actually fatigue the muscle. Also, those switches tend to require a fair amount of pressure to activate the switch's surface. Okay, so mechanical switches. Uh, the main mechanical switches that we're going to look at for people with muscle weakness are plate switches and light touch plate switches. AbleNet has the spec switch. This is a nice small switch. It's about maybe two inches across. It's great for capturing small movements because it doesn't take up a very uh, large amount of space. It's also fairly sensitive. It only requires uh, 3.5 ounces of force, and the travel distance you can see is quite small. Um, it's very, very small. The jelly bean switch actually requires less force. It's 2.5 ounces, and when we're dealing with muscle weakness, an ounce can be uh, very, very um, significant. But it is a larger target, and that can be a challenge for some of our clients. These also have good feedback. The uh, micro light, which is also available through AbleNet, requires less force than the specs, but is still very small. It requires uh, 0.4 ounces, so very, very light touch, and still uh, pretty small travel, about a quarter of an inch. Now it only activates, let me get my arrow again, on the far side. So it's kind of a lever type switch. If you were to push in this area by my arrow now, the switch may not activate. Where you need to push is on the far side, and that leverage helps to reduce the amount of force required. Now this is a rather fragile switch, which isn't generally a problem with people with muscle weakness, but it is something to keep in mind. I use this switch a lot. For if I'm using a mechanical switch, it's about the most sensitive mechanical switch that you can get. It's also a nice small size. It has a little tap screw in the bottom for mounting as well. Adaptivation has these PAL pads. They're fairly sensitive. I don't know the exact amount of ounces that are required to activate these. But they are a larger target, and that can be difficult when we're trying to capture very small movements. And Adaptive Switch Labs has this ultralight switch. It is um, similar to the microlight, except that the size here is a little more contoured so that someone doesn't have to lift up and over that edge of the microlight switch. But it does require a little more force than the microlight switch. It's 0.5 versus 0.4, so very similar. And it has two tap screws on the bottom surface for um, mounting as well. All right, let's take some questions because we definitely have some before we move on to electronic switches. Um, 
We have a question, which switch have you encountered that requires the lightest pressure in the mechanical switches? Um, the microlight switch is uh, probably our lightest option. And then electronic switches, which we'll cover here in a second, do not require any pressure. And um, Amanda has asked you have suggestions for a student who can activate the switch but not remove their hand. Um, the challenge there, if we have a client who can um, activate but not release, then either we need to determine if it's because the client is stabilizing against the switch and if there's a way of providing that stability elsewhere, or we need to look for a different site because, again, it brings us back to that criteria of what's an ideal switch site. Part of an ideal switch site is that the client can readily release the switch, and particularly for power and mobility, can release that very quickly and consistently and accurately. So you might need to look at a different switch site. And then I, Amanda's also asked, any switches with a built-in timer to turn off the switch? Um, I think you might be referring to if the client can't remove their hand. Um, the challenge there is we want the client to be able to turn off or release that switch independently, if at all possible. Um, and then Connie has asked, which is the most durable? Well, probably not the switches we're looking at today. Again, we're looking at um, switches for people with muscle weakness. For people who have um, a lot of tone, we're looking at more durable switches. And again, we'll definitely get to that uh, next time. All right, we have a poll here. Which type of mechanical switches are folks using with this population right now? Um, spec, microlight, or others? Again, we're just looking at mechanical switches at this point. And while those results are coming in, I know uh, Gloria's been busily getting back to a number of you. A number of you have said that you're um, not able to find the PowerPoint. You should have gotten that with your confirmation email. It's um, simply a PDF of this um, PowerPoint presentation. That's our handout for the day. And if you didn't get that, um, you can put something in the chat box, and Gloria will go ahead and email that to you. So um, more than half of you are using the um, spec switch, and then uh, about a third the microlight or other. Um, for those who marked other, if you want, go ahead and throw something in the chat box for me. Let me know which um, mechanical switches you are liking for people with muscle weakness. I'd love to know. OK, so next we're going to turn to electronic switches. So electronic switches that are commonly used for people who have muscle weakness include proximity, fiber optic, infrared, touch, sensor, and something called piezoelectric film, which is used to de detect uh, vibration. So let's start with proximity switches. These are all electronic switches that we're going to be discussing, and so these do not require activation force, but some travel distance is required. AbleNet has this candy corn switch, and it's a capacitive switch. And proximity switches are capacitive switches. And in layman's terms, this switch can determine our capacity to conduct electricity. So if we wave our hand over the surface of this, it will activate. If your cat puts their paw on top of this, it will activate. If you put a math book on top of it, it will not activate. So it has to be something capable of conducting electricity. So the client only needs to approach this. Adaptive switch labs, AMDI, stealth products, and switch it all sell proximity switches. Sometimes these are sold in an array and those are usually used for power mobility, but you can get these as an individual switch as well. Typically, you can adjust the um, sensitivity on these, and that means how close does the client need to get to the switch to activate it. So we can capture that very small movement. And 
since this is an electronic switch, if we don't have a power chair that this is on, and then we can take um, advantage of that power source, we have to plug the switch into something, uh, into a rechargeable uh, battery, because it does require power. One disadvantage of proximity switches for people with muscle weakness at times is that the uh, switch itself is a little bulky, and that can be uh, sometimes an issue. And this is showing um, some examples of proximity arrays. In this case, we have a special half tray, and it's hollow. And inside, we can place four proximity switches for driving a power chair, forward, left, right, and reverse, or reset. And in this case on the right, we have a head array. A head array is a very common alternative access method for driving. And uh, in this situation, we have one proximity in the back pad, and that's for forward. And then we have proximities on the sides for left and right. Often used, uh, both of these for people with decreased muscle strength. All right, let me check our messages here. Um, could, uh, sorry. Oh, Amanda, I'm sorry. <laughs> I did answer your question, Amanda, but it sounds like you lost your connection during that time. Um, so let me briefly answer that again. If the client is having difficulty removing their hand from the switch surface, then we have two possible scenarios most of the time. Either the client stabilizing against the surface of the switch, you can see if there's something you can do within their positioning to help minimize that tendency to stabilize against the switch, give them some more stability, or look for a different switch site because part of the criteria for that ideal switch site is we want the client to readily be able to release that switch um, accurately, consistently. And some people have let me know about some other switches that they are using for people with muscle weakness, mechanical switches, uh, jelly bean, uh, pal pads, string switch. Hmm, that's interesting. String switch um, has a lot of leverage. Sometimes that's a hard one for uh, people with muscle weakness. Um, and Matthew has asked, why don't I see any responses in the chat area? I'm sorry. I c I'm the only one who can see those, and that's why I try to go ahead and um, answer those verbally and repeat them. Uh, Jennifer has also said she uses eye gaze, which is another access method that certainly can be very useful for people with uh, muscle weakness. Great. OK, I think we've got those answered here. Um, Oh, Paris has asked, any suggestions for proximity switches if only volitional access site is iBlink? Hang in there, Paris, because we're going to get to iBlink very soon. And uh, someone else has also asked, where do you look to support if they are resting on the switch PAL pad? Uh, same as Amanda's question, if someone's resting on that surface, uh, it might be that that's not their best um, site. But hang in. I hope this information will help us out with some of these questions. So fiber optics. We already saw a picture of fiber optics with Julian. One of the things that's great about fiber optic switches is we have an extremely small target. Um, the surface of a fiber optic switch is smaller than a pencil eraser. And there's no pressure required because, again, this is an electronic switch. The client just needs to approach the fiber optic, and we can adjust the amount of distance that's required for the client to get to that. Um, fiber optics are available from Adaptive Switch Labs, AMDI. Uh, sorry, I don't know why that's uh, indented there. It should not be Stealth Products and Switch It. Here's an example of fiber optics mounted within a tray surface. In this case here on the right, the client can rest their hand on the surface of the tray and move a finger or thumb over any and all of these four switch locations. Now, the fiber optic cabling is inside of this hollow tray, and these locations can be placed anywhere on the tray surface that meets the client's needs. Here on the left side, the switches are in the side of the tray, and that's because for some clients with muscle weakness, 
if the client can flex their fingers over the edge of that tray, bringing the finger back a little bit into flexion might be an easier movement for that client than moving them on a flat surface back and forth. Here's some other mounting ideas for fiber optics. We saw this picture before of Julian, where we've taken that fiber optic switch and put it right through the hand pad. This is part of an Autobach arm trough. So he has full support of his um, arm and his hand. And over here on the right is another hand pad. This is available from uh, Stealth Products. And here we have three fiber optic switches. There's a space here for a fourth. And these are mounted in very small, about two inch long goosenecks so that the exact placement of that fiber optic can be varied to match an individual client's needs. This can be placed at the end of an arm rest or an arm trough, again providing that important support for this very small movement. Fiber optics aren't always placed just by the fingers or thumbs, but these can be placed by the side of the head as well. Here on the left, we have a fiber optic switch cabling mounted in some lock line, over to the right in a gooseneck, and then finally even in a specialized headset. All right, let's take a quick look at these questions before we get to infrared. We have a lot of people on the webinar today, which is great, and that means lots of questions. Um, <clears throat> we have a question, is there any future webinars on introduction to switch use, like computer programs and toys? Um, you can check on the AbleNet site to see what some of the upcoming webinars are, um, because I think there are some that are going to cover some of those issues. So. Um, keep an eye out for that. All right, infrared switches. Now, infrared is the same technology that's used on the end of your uh, remote control for the television. In this case, let me get my pointer again. Maybe, there we go. These are two little diodes, infrared diodes, at the end of the scatter switch. And the scatter switch um, was originally developed from University of Michigan and is distributed by AbleNet at this time. SCATTER stands for Self-Calibrating Auditory Tone Infrared. Now where infrared is really helpful is for capturing eye blinks. And for people with profound muscle weakness, sometimes eye blinks are what we really need to use um, for activating a switch for accessing assistive technology. So if you look here on the right, you can see that same diode that is mounted on a pair of eyeglasses. So even if your client doesn't wear eyeglasses, they can get a pair of frames or use a pair of frames that I believe still comes with this switch that doesn't have any glass in it. And it is positioned in such a way to capture an eye blink. Now this can be adjusted so that it ignores those typical blinks that we make throughout the day just to keep our eyes moist, but notices a more intentional eye blink for the client. The client needs to really stay very still, but generally that's not a problem, again, for people with muscle weakness. Enabling devices has an eye blink switch. This also uses infrared technology, and you can see that it's mounted here on a pair of eyeglasses. There are touch switches that are available as well. Uh, these do require a little bit of force, but not too much. The main drawback for some of these particular switches is that the targets are sometimes just a little too big to capture these very, very small movements. There are also switches that are called a sensor switch. In this case, there's a sensor that's placed over a muscle. It picks up activity in the muscle. And particularly for people who have muscle weakness, this is often used over the eyebrows. So you can have a small sensor, I'll show you a picture of one in a minute, that's placed on, say, a headband, place it over the eyebrow, 
And if that person can wiggle their eyebrows around, smile, frown, grimace, it can pick up that activity. I do not recommend using eye blink switches or particularly sensor switches for people who are using power mobility because there's vibration that comes through the power wheelchair itself and sometimes that can be read by the switch and actually trigger the switch. Here are several examples of sensor switches and um, they're available from um, John Johnson enabling devices and there's this uh, newer one called the Tinkertron EMG switch. So if you see that term EMG, these are um, sensor type switches. All right, then we have um, piezoelectric film. Now piezoelectric film looks kind of like a piece of saran wrap. It's this little piece of film and when it's vibrated, it will activate the switch. Again, these are not recommended for power mobility because vibration of the power chair uh, does sometimes lead to the switch being activated. And here's two examples. On the left is the enabling devices twitch switch. This little piece of uh, blue here mounted to this young man's uh, temple area when he makes a face, if he grimaces or smiles, it wrinkles that little piece of film and that's what activates the switch and you can adjust the sensitivity of that. And towards the right side is the AMDI piezo uh, switch. It looks like a sensor switch but it is using this piezoelectric film. So, Earlier, I had encouraged you to think about a, a client, a particular client with muscle weakness, and think about what type of switch site and switch type might be helpful for them. So go ahead, think about that client again if you identified one, now that we've gone through a number of potential switch types, and think about the type that might work well for that particular client. All right. Uh, let me just check our questions here really quick and then we're going to move into a switch site hierarchy of some potential sites for people who have muscle weakness. Um, there's a few questions here that um, I really appreciate people asking but aren't uh, pertinent to what we're able to cover in our webinar today. So I'm going to skip those and we will follow up with you uh, later on. Okay, I think we're ready to move forward there. Okay, here's our second poll, I believe. If you could go ahead and mark where you're most frequently placing switches right now when you're working with clients who have muscle weakness, either by the hands, the head, specifically the fingers, or elsewhere. All right. And we have a lot of folks again on this call, so I'll give folks a minute to go ahead and put in their answer there. And some of you might be thinking, I'm not really putting place, uh, switches on clients right now. That's fine. But if you are, where are you putting those switches? So it looks like hands are ahead, closely followed by the head and then by the fingers and a few other locations as well. Great. All right, well, let's start with those hands. Now, we already saw these proximity switches. If we're using proximity switches by the hands, we can use these to capture finger movement. But since this is a little larger target, sometimes we might capture uh, a little larger movement of the hands. These can be actually placed within the tray because as a capacitive switch, they will not be activated by the tray themselves it will be activated by someone's hand over the tray. By placing this underneath the tray, now the client, rather than having to lift up and over a mechanical switch, simply needs to slide over the location of the proximity switch, and that requires less strength. We can also capture finger movement. On the left here, we have two examples of doing that with 
fiber optic switches. Again, we've seen this picture of Julian with a little fiber optic switch in the hand pad of an arm trough. Here we have another client, Fareed, who has a custom-made arm trough, and the fiber optic is placed on the edge of this for him to use a slight uh, flexor movement. And over here on the right is Christopher, and he's using a micro light on a gooseneck, and he's extending his finger slightly and activating that switch, and that's working well for him. Now, this is during an evaluation. Notice he has some strapping here, and he has an arm trough. His arm wasn't staying within that arm trough. We recommended a better support system for him to keep him in alignment with the switch. Here's two more examples of capturing finger movement. Uh, this is Fareed again. This is when Fareed is laying in bed. He spends a lot of time in his bed. He has a custom-made arm trough in bed, and he pulls his finger back towards this fiber optic switch to activate it. We're going to watch a video of this in just a moment. And this is Krista, and Krista has a micro light mounted right in front of her fingers, and she extends to activate those. And in the background, besides her dog, I believe, we also see Jill Tolman. She's a speech therapist I work with extensively. She's very, very smart. All right, so let's watch a video of Fareed activating this fiber optic switch in bed. Perfect, Fareed. I like how you're moving towards that. Great, so hopefully you were able to see that well, depending on your connection speed. He has a very, very small movement with almost no force. This switch is able to capture that movement. We're able to calibrate the activation distance. And uh, since no force is required, this works very well for him. And we're now going to watch Krista. Again, she has a mechanical switch placed in front of her fingers the micro light. The advantage of the mechanical switch is we don't need a power source in her manual chair, and she extends her fingers with a very small movement to activate this switch. I see Colby. I don't know where Silver went. Silver ran away. Silver got tired of us uh, talking her. about her. Uh huh. Is he here? And it looks like you have a brother and a sister, huh? Yeah. And what are their names? Hi, Jackie. So you can see that very, very small movement that she is using. Further down our hierarchy is using the head. And the side of the head can work very well for a lot of clients, even clients with muscle weakness, because we have a lot of leverage behind that head movement. And here are two clients who are using a spec switch by the side of their head. Let me get that arrow again. There we go. So here is Joe using a spec switch um, by the side of his head. Here it's mounted on a stealth headrest. Actually, all three of these are mounted on a stealth headrest. Uh, this is Brady, and he has a switch by the right side of his head. And down below, this is uh, AJ, and he has a jelly bean right by his cheekbone. And all of them are using a very small movement to activate those switches. Now we can also capture movement under the chin or by the side of the chin using either jaw or head movement. This is a special headset that's made from adaptive switch labs, and it has a little hollow aluminum tube at the end that's uh, pliable, and we've uh, put some fiber optic cabling through this. It can be aimed right at the side of someone's jaw and capture a very small movement, again, with no force. Less used sites, but sites that can be very helpful with this population is at the eyebrow using sensor switches and eye blink using infrared switches. Now, I'm going to get to these questions, but one of the questions that we've had is uh, from Stacy is eye blink, should I use fiber optic or sensor? For eye blinks, you definitely want to use infrared. Fiber optic, actually, that fiber optic light can be damaging to the white of the eye. So do not use 
fiber optics, it is possible to capture eye blinks with fiber optics, but it's not safe. So infrared is safe to be directed towards the eye. Another potential switch site is at the mouth, but usually movement of the tongue and control of sip and puffs, which is just not possible for most clients who have uh, muscle weakness. Particularly clients who have ALS, uh, sip and puff simply doesn't work. The client has to maintain air pressure within the mouth, and that doesn't work for those clients because of uh, issues with the soft palate. Placing switches by the feet usually requires too large a movement for people with muscle weakness, but depending on your client and where they are in the progression of their condition, that might be an option. Usually placing a switch by the outer knee or above the knee requires, again, a rather large movement. But I'm always surprised that a lot of clients with muscle weakness can use some hip adduction to access a switch by the inner side, the medial side of their knee. And here's two examples of that now. Uh, this is Julian, again, who has a fiber optic up here in his hand pad, but by the inside of his knee has a microlight switch. And this is mounted on a swing-away joystick mount, actually. But he's able to use some hip adduction and um, access this switch. Over here on the right is Fareed, and he has proximity switches, these, these yellow uh, switches here by the inner knees. And we had to raise his feet a little bit to unweight the distal thighs, just enough to allow him that hip adduction. This is a movement that's often spared in clients who have spinal muscular atrophy. Movement at the thumb and forefinger and hip adduction are common movements spared in that uh, particular condition. So if you're still thinking about that client, and hopefully have already thought about a potential switch type to use, think about where you might try to place that switch for that client as well. All right, let's get back to some of these great questions. Uh, Christy has asked, is one particular proximity switch known to be more durable and accessible for young kids? Um, and some of the concerns are that this switch maybe has to be moved between shares and positions. Um, because, yeah, usually for someone with muscle weakness, we don't have to worry about durability as much. Um, these proximity switches are actually very, uh, very durable. The ones that I've had most experience with are the ones from Adaptive Switch Labs. And um, starting to get a little more experience with these Stealth Products ones. They're pretty new. And um, they're uh, pretty darn durable, uh, so I haven't had a problem with durability there. Um, and uh, let's see, um, I see your question about Huntington's disease. That again is a different population than what we're um, dealing with today. I would encourage you to join us for our next webinar. Just uh, lack of time. I apologize. And uh, Julie, you said. Um, just, I think, mostly thank you. So uh, thank you very much for your comments. And Jacqueline has asked, are there vendors where you can trial these switch products? Definitely. Um, most of these companies will send you a switch to try out with a client to see if it works. A lot of these switches, you can't just guess if it's going to work. You really do have to try that out. So I would encourage you to contact the manufacturers and see if they have someone in your area that can help you out, or if you can uh, try that. Some of uh, the larger assistive technology clinics will have these um, in stock, or uh, if a school has an assistive technology team, et cetera. Uh, Wendy's asked, would a child with Duchenne muscular dystrophy benefit from switches like these? Absolutely. Um, as that condition progresses, these uh, young men definitely need switches, and those switches need to consider just everything we've been talking about, that smaller travel distance and uh, low force, low activation force. Um, 
Jenny's asked, are there any switches that are more appropriate or more easily adaptable to clients with significant cognitive impairments? Um, typically, people with muscle weakness do not have the cognitive involvement that we see in other populations. Um, but that brings up a good question. This might be helpful. Um, April 14th, we're having the third part of this switch assessment series. And we're going to be talking about how do we figure out switch assessment? How do we develop switch skills for clients who are just not engaged? And oftentimes, that's because of cognitive impairments, where it's more difficult for the client to, to uh, readily see where the switch can be beneficial for them. Um, so that might be a helpful uh, webinar. All right, and um, great, that question's for Gloria. Good, okay, so our next uh, order of business in this webinar is a case study. So we've seen some pictures of Julian already, but let's put this in context. Um, at the time of this particular evaluation, Julian was eight years old. I've known Julian since he was about two, and he is actually uh, just starting college now. So his access needs have changed over the years, but we're going to take a quick peek at what his access needs were when he was about eight. Julian required a combination of switch types and sites to meet his needs. And at the time, his primary need was accessing his power wheelchair. He is verbal. He is on a ventilator. He has become more difficult to understand over the years. Um, so he does use some other technology. But at this time, primarily, we are looking at power wheelchair. To move the wheelchair forward, he used a fiber optic switch mounted by his right thumb. And we've seen this picture a few times now. So this is mounted throughout, uh, through the hand pad. Simply took a little drill bit, uh, popped a hole right through the thumb, uh, right, not through the thumb, that's right, through the foam. Oh my gosh, that's a faux pas. And put that fiber optic right in there. And then the cabling is underneath the arm trough. The cabling is very fragile. You need to be protective of that. So when he moved that thumb over the fiber optic site, it would activate it and move his chair forward. To stop, he would pull his thumb to the side. He also had two proximity switches on his chair that were built into the headrest. So the proximity switch that's mounted in this pad by the right side of his head turned the chair to the right. The proximity switch that was mounted by the left side of his head did not turn the chair to the left. This was a reset switch. A reset switch places the chair into a different mode of operation. And that allowed him to redefine what his driving switches did. So for example, if he pressed activated this reset switch, then the next time he approached the right switch, instead of turning the chair to the right, he would be able to control his power tilt system. We put the reset switch by the left side of his head because it was his weakest switch site. And he didn't need to hit the reset switch as often as the other switches. To turn left, we actually placed this little micro light switch by the inner side of his right knee. This required him to move that leg a bit to the left. We wanted this to be as intuitive as possible. And so this allowed him to drive the chair, turn the chair to the left by bringing his leg in that direction. So let's review our take home message here. And then we'll go ahead and take any last minute questions. When we're doing um, determining the best switch access for people who have muscle weakness, it's important that we look at small activation travel, little or no activation force, either using very sensitive mechanical switches or electronic switches, which require no force. It's important that we can accommodate change, because many of these clients have a progressive condition, and that we bring in adequate postural support to help this client to maximize the abilities that they have. All right, so let's take some more of these great questions. 
Um, can you? So someone has asked. Um, sorry. <laughs> Sometimes the questions scroll along kind of fast in the chat box here. If a client has a degenerative condition such as Duchenne muscular dystrophy, is it more advisable to select a switch that will work at the client's ultimate level of functioning or to change the type of switch the client deteriorates? You know, that's a good question. Particularly with Duchenne's, I find that I end up changing access methods. So with power mobility as an example, I might start that client with a standard joystick. We might do some programming to accommodate changes in muscle strength eventually changing to a mini proportional joystick, and then ultimately looking at switches. The main reason for that is we're helping the client to be as independent and efficient in their access as possible as they have those changes, rather than immediately going to something like fiber optic switches where the client would lose that proportional control. And um, Monique has asked, why do you set the left head switch as reset and not turn to the left? Again, that was his weakest site. So in general, with power mobility, we want the strongest switch site to move the client forward because that needs to be activated and sustained for longer periods of time. And then um, the weaker switch site for reset because that's not a timed activation. If the client doesn't hit reset right away, it's not a big deal. Or if they don't let go of reset right away, not a big deal. So reset I put in that weaker switch site. And that was Julian's um, situation. Okay. And I know uh, Ann Jeanette, I hope I'm saying your name right, you wanted some information on the candy corn switch. Um, let's see here. Um, I just have to go up to your original question. I apologize. Um, the Oh, dear. I'm trying to find your question about the candy corn switch, so just hang on just one moment. Um, here we go. Can you send an email about how you would have a student use the candy corn, either finger or hand? Um, it really depends on that individual's requirements. So you want to, again, getting back to the beginning of this webinar, look at what's the available movement for the client, what's the available uh, travel and force, and then match that to the best switch. If the candy corn matches that, if the client has enough movement to activate that and requires no force, then that could be a good option. If they have a smaller movement than that which would be required by the candy corn switch, you may want to look at fiber optics. And let me see if I missed any other questions here. Uh, what vendors do you recommend for microlight and proximity switches? Um, those, again, are listed right in the webinar there. Microlight's available from AbleNet. Proximity switches you can get from a variety of, of companies. Um, they're available from um, AbleNet, also available from other companies. All right. Gloria, did I miss any questions in there? We just have a, a lot of questions, and I want to make sure I didn't miss anything. Um, if we wrap this up and we run out of time, don't worry. We'll go ahead and um, try to follow up with you by email. So I want to thank you for attending this webinar here today and make sure that you have my contact info. Um, want to remind you too that on March 10th we're having the second part of this series where we're going to talk about switch assessment for people with increased muscle tone. I know we had a number of questions about that. And then uh, also our third part on April 14th specifically looking at how do we determine where to put a switch for clients who just aren't very engaged in the process. Uh, Mary's asked, do you have some type of chart to help determine switches based on certain attributes? I do not. I've, I've tried. It's really kind of, I've had, I've struggled getting that information into some type of a, of a chart. Uh, it's um, too many gray areas. Uh, Jennifer's asked, what can people operate with their switches besides mobility? All sorts of things, um, communication devices, electronic age daily living, switch toys, computers. Um, yes, you can use these for computer access as well. 
Great. Um, so I hope, again, this information was helpful to you. We're almost out of time. Uh, please fill out the survey that will show up after we are done with this webinar so that we can get your feedback. Um, it helps AbleNet and myself to determine how to better uh, present this information and what other information we need to make sure we're um, providing to you. So thanks. Thank you on behalf of AbleNet. We're right at the top of the hour and uh, we will go ahead and sign off today and I hope that you can join us for the next AbleNet webinar. Thanks everyone.